There is a really fun children's book titled, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. Any parents or young people familiar with that one? Okay, grandparents too, yes? So it was one of our boys' favorites, and the story goes like this. If you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to want a glass of milk. And if you give him a glass of milk, then he's going to want a napkin. If you give him a napkin, he's going to want to look in the mirror to see if he wiped off his milk mustache. And then the adventure continues on and on around the house and all different kinds of things, circling back to him being tired and hungry and wanting a cookie. And if you give a mouse a cookie, and here we go again. You know, this has become actually sort of a catchphrase in our home, um, just to illustrate the relationship between actions. Another version might go like this. If you buy your wife a new kitchen faucet, she's going to want a new sink. And if you get her a new sink, she's going to want new countertops. And it has to stop somewhere, folks. It has to stop somewhere. Uh, the word if shows the relationship between two statements. It shows that, that there are related outcomes. Well, last week we started a new series entitled If, looking at those statements in Scripture that are related to one another. And so through this series, we're going to be looking at statements in the Bible that instruct us how to live. For example, Jesus said, If you love me, then you'll keep my commandments. Right? Another way would be, uh, if we do something, then something else will result. For example, like we looked at last week in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, then the result is that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from uh, all unrighteousness. These are fantastic truths that you can really, really cling to. A third way is this. Scripture uses if to reveal what is actually true about us based on our actions, regardless of what we claim. Again, last week we looked at if you claim to have fellowship with God, but you walk in darkness, well, you lie and you're not actually living in the truth. And so this morning, I want to draw your attention to another if statement, and we're going to be looking in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, you can turn there in your copy of Scripture, you can swipe there uh, on your device, and if you are using the hardback Bibles in the chair rack in front of you, you can turn to page 860. 860. Now, as you are finding your way there, I want to remind you of something, uh, perhaps inform you of something, actually. Uh, the Bible is not simply a collection of 30,000 individual verses. The Bible is not a collection of 30,000 individual verses. In fact, the Bible wasn't written originally with chapters or verses. It wasn't until the mid-1500s that verses uh, and chapters were printed with the Bible text. Now, don't get me wrong. It makes it very, very helpful to navigate. It makes it very helpful to uh, locate a, a specific passage of Scripture. It's helpful for memorization. It's helpful for uh, uh, group reading together. But I'm afraid that sometimes in our use of Scripture, we tend to quote and we tend to use verses as standalone statements without taking into account the context which that statement is set. Context is crucial to fully understanding what a passage is saying. One of the benefits I mentioned last week, one of the benefits of, of this series, I think, is that I get to demonstrate good Bible study to show you how to understand the meaning of a section of Scripture, and context plays a major role in that. 
And not only context, within the passage itself, right? What comes before, what comes after, things like this, but the historical context of a passage. So, for example, as we're considering 2 Peter, it's important to know this, that this letter is a second letter written by Peter, the apostle Peter. And the time or the time frame in which this was written, he's likely writing this from imprisonment in Rome. Yes, Peter, not Paul. Peter. It's likely that uh, there was great persecution against Christians. It was probably during the reign of Nero over the Roman Empire. And he would be writing this likely be, shortly before he was put to death by execution. And so he's writing this short letter, again, to the same recipients as the first one. It mentions that in chapter 3, although it's not addressed specifically in the beginning. He's writing to encourage these believers in these churches to reject false teaching, to stand firm in the grace of God, and to live a life that pleases God. Now, while the if statement that we are going to look at is actually found in verse 8 of chapter 1, in order to understand its context, because it's absolutely crucial that we understand the textual context, we're going to pick it up in verse 3, okay? So verse 3, here we go. His divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life. Perhaps your version says this, all things that pertain to life and godliness. Okay, so his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by or to his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that Through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. I'm going to pause there for a second. I don't know if there is a more dense uh, passage, such a short, compact, dense passage of Scripture that contains so much truth, okay? So... um, You know, like before you run a race or before you, you, you kind of work out, you want to warm up a little bit, all right? I'm not going to ask you to stand or do stretches, but like warm up your mind, okay? Because this is, I need you to, all right? Here we go. So we're going to unpack this a little bit because this is the context that we're going to be talking about. So uh, it says, his divine power, whose God's, God's divine power has given, has provided all that we need for a godly life, for a life that pleases God. So his power is God's power. The we there is those who have received a faith in Jesus Christ. And that comes from verse uh, 2. If you just look up one verse, he's writing, or maybe it's verse 1. He's writing to those who have received or those who have obtained a faith as precious as ours in Jesus Christ. So, he's writing to believers God's power has provided everything that believers need to live a godly life. So let's further unpack this a little bit. This power for a godly life comes through what? What does it say? Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So our knowledge of God. But what specifically about God? The fact that he called us to himself by his own glory and goodness or glory and excellence. Okay? So as as our knowledge of God, specifically that he's called us to himself by his own glory and goodness grows, that's how we tap into, that's how we access this power for a godly life. Okay? So here we go. Let's continue to move on. Through these, okay, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. Through these, through what? Through his glory and his goodness. Through his glory and his excellence, he has given us great and precious 
promises. And what are these promises? Well, it's the promise that we can participate or we can become partakers in the divine nature. Now, if I stand up here and I say that divine nature means that we'll become gods, you can physically pick me up and escort me to the parking lot because that is not what that is saying. We don't become gods. Man does not become God. What happened? God became man. That's right. Let's not get that flipped around. Okay? So what this means is we can participate. We can become partakers in the divine nature. The divine nature, what? we can be godly. We don't become God, but we can, we can be godly. God promises and provides power so that we can be godly. And then it ends this section with this. Having escaped the corruption of the world and its evil desires. So, I'm going to try and summarize that for you, and I'm going to break it down to one statement that if you're a note taker, you can write this down. So here we go. In verse 3, this is what it says. God's power to be godly has been given to all who have faith in Jesus. This power is accessed by our knowledge of God who calls us to His own glory and goodness. Through His own glory and goodness, He promises that we can be godly and that we can escape the corruption of this world caused by sinful desires. Here's the statement. God's promise and power for us to be godly. If there is a heading above uh, that uh, section in your Bible, it should say, God's promise and power for us to be godly. This is fantastic news. This is wonderfully encouraging news. Because this means that those things that you're struggling with in life, right? As you, as you think about how how far you yet have to grow in your spiritual walk, if you, if you are so tired of tripping over the same sins in your life, if you are so frustrated with being weighted down by the pressure of your flesh and you find yourself giving in to it, if you are just so done with sin having a foothold in your life, this is wonderful, wonderful news that God not only promises, but He provides the power for you to be godly. And so, it then moves on from there. And this is why context is key. Look at verse 5. What does it say in verse 5? It says, for this reason. For what reason? The very reason. This is the... Because God has promised and provided the power for you to be godly. Because of that, do this. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection. Because God has provided and promised that you can be godly, Go for it, (laughs) right? Add to your faith. Whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm sorry, what'd you say? Add to your faith? Hold on a minute. Faith plus something? Uh, Pastor, that's not the gospel. Well, you would be right. (laughs) You would be right. This passage is in no way saying that we have to add anything to our genuine faith in order that God would save us or that... Uh, he would love us in Christ. Don't misunderstand. you got to get these things in order. Okay? We labor to be godly because God has already labored for us. We strive to be righteous because God has already credited us with Christ's righteousness. We work out our salvation because God has already saved us. Don't reverse the order. 
Do not reverse the order. We don't effort to please God so he will love us. He has loved us in Christ and in that love given us what we need to please him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if, if, if your son were to come in from the garage and say, hey, dad, I just finished cleaning the garage. Do you love me now? What? What do you mean? What do you mean, do I love you now? I loved you before. And I loved you if you, if you didn't clean the garage. My, my love is not dependent upon anything that you do. Sure, I'm pleased that you did that, but that has no bearing on my love for you or that what makes you my son. Don't reverse that order. God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Don't reverse that order. Because that is the gospel, that we are all sinners. We have all rebelled against God. We've rebelled against God's design for our life. We've rebelled against God's authority in our life. We've rebelled against Him as the object of our worship. And even while we were still sinners, while we were rebelling against him, God entered into humanity in the person of Jesus and he died on the cross, an atoning death to cover the sins of any who would believe in him. And when we trust in Christ, he covers, he cleanses, and he carries away our sins and he clothes us with his own righteousness. Have you put your faith in Jesus to cover your sins? A genuine faith is all that is needed. You don't have to clean yourself up first. He does the cleaning later. You don't have to turn your life around. He turns your life around later. You don't have to add anything to faith first. By His power, He adds to our faith later. Now, if we look at this list of attributes here in Scripture that we're encouraged to add to our faith or really furnish our faith, more add in faith, we'll see that it begins with faith and it ends with love. This is a hallmark of New Testament teaching, faith and love. And and really, the original language isn't so much that we're adding to our faith, but really we are adding in our faith. So we're stepping out in faith to add godliness to our lives, and then we are in faith adding knowledge, and then in faith we are adding self-control and godliness and perseverance and love. Okay, so now we come to verse 8, and we come finally to our if statement. It says, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm going to read that one more time. This is our if statement. This is what it's going to hinge on. For if... You possess these qualities in increasing measure, pressing forward, pressing forward. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing I think is is important to note here is that it is possible to be ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be unaware. It is absolutely possible to be ineffective and unproductive. I see that happening two ways. First way, someone trusts in Jesus for salvation. Their sins are forgiven. They are saved. And then they don't really grow much beyond that. Their knowledge of Jesus, our Lord, never really grows beyond Jesus died for me. Now, (laughs) don't get me wrong. That is a great truth, and that is one that you need to be sure of. But if your understanding of our Lord Jesus never grows beyond that, or never grows much beyond that, well, you're going to be unproductive and ineffective in your knowledge of Him. 
The second way that you could be ineffective or unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So, someone trusts in Jesus for salvation, their sins are forgiven, they are saved. And then they begin to learn. I mean, they learn, they read, they study, they listen, they take classes. But it never translates to qualities of goodness or self-control or perseverance or kindness or love in their life. All their knowledge of the Lord Jesus is ineffective and unproductive. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there is a corresponding relationship to our knowledge of the Lord and our ability to live godly lives. Bring your attention back to verse 3. Back to verse 3. What does it say? His divine power... Through his power, he has given us everything that we need for a godly life. How? Through our knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and goodness. This power to live a godly life is accessed by our knowledge of God who calls us to his own glory and goodness. And if you don't have these characteristics, these qualities in increasing measure in your life, then, then you will be ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord, which is the very way that you live a godly life. Let me see if I can explain it this way. Okay? Uh, so, we, we seek to learn. We seek to know more about this God who is creator of the universe This God of glory and excellence. This God who promises that we can escape the corruption of this world. This God who promises that we can overcome our evil desires. This God who promises that we can be partakers in His very own godliness. This God who calls us into a relationship with Him. This God who provided the very payment that He required through His own Son. And when our knowledge of this God grows, well then we begin to add to our faith goodness. And in that goodness, we see more reflections of God. And so our knowledge of Him grows. And as we grow in our knowledge of Him, we add self-control. Self-control and self-denial in the face of temptation. And then to that, we add perseverance to keep on through the difficult times. And perseverance through hard times produces godliness. And godliness expresses itself in brotherly love, which then grows into love. This is a godly life. This is a life that has applied the knowledge of God to access the power of God to live a life pleasing to God. Now, there is a second if. It's not explicitly stated there. It's sort of implicitly. You have to read it even though it's not there. Verse 9. Verse 9 in my text, it says, but whoever does not have them, you could also say, if you don't have these qualities in increasing measure. Right? You see that there? It's sort of an implied if. There's a condition there. Whoever doesn't have them, if you don't have these qualities in increasing measure, if this isn't a priority to you, if you haven't tapped into the knowledge of God that produces qualities of God, which really spirals and cyclically grows into further and deeper godliness, if you're like, nah, then what happens? That person is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. Nearsighted and blind. You know, it it doesn't really say exactly, specifically what that is, so we're kind of left to speculate or imagine, but I'm positive that it's not talking about needing glasses. 
It could be that we're blind to what God is doing in the world. It could be that we're nearsighted and we're unable to see anything beyond the events that are just affecting me. We're unable to see past the trial and and we cannot trust God through difficult times. Perhaps we're even blind to the truth of God. It says another result of that, that these people who don't have these qualities, have not tapped into the knowledge of God and the power of God through a, for a godly life, they have forgotten that they've been cleansed from their past sins. This one, we are not left to speculate. This is very clear, and its meaning is far more dangerous. To forget that you have been cleansed from past sins is to forget that you've been freed from the guilt of your past. And if you forget that you have been cleared and set free from the guilt of your past, then you, then you have forgotten that you are freed from the power of sin. And if you forget, if you lose sight, that God's forgiveness of your past sin frees you from the power of sin, then you will find yourself committing sin and surrendering to its power. A second danger of this is is to forget that you've been cleansed from past sins is to forget that God no longer sees you as a sinner, but he sees you as righteous. So to forget that means that you're going to spend all of your energy trying to earn God's love instead of enjoying God's love. And frankly, to forget that you've been cleansed from past sins makes you no different in thought or deed than an unbeliever. So, to the Christian, to the one who is a believer in Jesus, make every effort to add to your faith these qualities because they will produce an even deeper knowledge of God which will prevent you from being ineffective and unproductive in the knowledge of God that produces a godly life. And it will keep you from being nearsighted and blind, forgetting the very work of Christ on your behalf. And if you're here and you haven't trusted fully in Jesus to save you, to forgive your sins and to present you to God, completely righteous. Your first step is to trust in Jesus as Savior. If you're here today and you've never trusted in Jesus, His work on the cross to cover, to cleanse, and to carry away your sin, my prayer is that you will not leave today without having that settled. Please talk to me afterwards. I want to open God's word with you so you can know for sure that Jesus is your Savior. 